Hello. Yes, so my day job is uh, studying the origins of human uniqueness. But today I'm going to talk about something different. I'm going to tell you a story about how I ended up helping build what one reviewer called, by some distance, the balmiest object ever conceived by anyone anywhere, which honestly is, I think, the best review I've ever had uh, for anything. Um, it's a story about musicians and machines. It's a story about uh, a social media bot, but one made of wood and brass. It's a story about holding up a mirror to our own obsession with uh, online celebrity. And it's a story that starts out in a porter cabin in Leith and ends up rather unexpectedly in the glitz and glamour of the BAFTA award ceremony. But let's go back to the beginning. So about 15 years or so ago, um, I was working with um, a couple of musicians and artists, uh, Tommy Perman and Lomond Campbell here. And we were interested in building uh, musical installations um, and making music with machines. And because of this, we were really fascinated at the time um, about musical automata. These were machines made around the turn of the last century. Incredibly beautiful mechanical ways of making music. Things like this. This is an orchestrion um, at the uh, Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow. These incredibly beautiful elaborate machines um, were completely mechanical um, and played music through a, a range of different instruments. But I was particularly interested in how these machines were advertised at the time. So this is uh, an advert for a Sicilian uh, uh, player piano. And the way they were often advertised was they were advertised as if they were human in some way, as if they were a piano player, like a perfect person to have along at a cocktail party you might throw. And it's interesting also to look at this advert, which I just discovered actually a couple of days ago. Um, this was uh, an example of using uh, a player piano to help avoid a deadly pandemic. But this is a deadly pandemic in 1918 and encouraging people to stay home and uh, sit with their player piano rather than go out. So we were looking at these um, machines that were made at the t end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century. And we started wondering, what would a 21st century player piano be like? Well, just as the uh, 19th century and 20th century automata were made to be like musicians of the time, we wondered, what's a 21st century musician like? What does a 21st century musician obsess about? Well, it turns out we were 21st century musicians, so we had some insight into that, and actually had some insight about what 21st century humans obsess about. And it's this. Certainly at the time, um, around 2009, it was the growth of these companies. So some of you, I hope, will recognize some of these icons. Um, does anyone recognize the first one there? Anyone? No one. Ah, right, you've just aged yourselves. So, um, <laughs> yeah, this is MySpace. Um, the young people in the audience won't recognize this because this was a social media company which is the largest at the time um, that disappeared. So even giants fall. And actually, since I last gave a talk like this, the one on the end is falling too. Uh, now, what's interesting about MySpace in particular, at the time, there was this myth that if you were a band and you had enough followers on MySpace, you would get signed by a major label. And this myth came about because uh, the band, I think it was the Arctic Monkeys, um, got a lot of followers on MySpace and were signed on that basis. So 21st century musicians and 21st century humans are essentially obsessing about their popularity on these social media platforms. So we thought maybe we can build a, a player piano or an orchestrion that was obsessed with its social media popularity. So that's what we set out to do. 
So when we were building Cyberfon, we thought we wanted to hearken back to some of these um, hundred-year-old machines. So our first task was to go around junk shops and find objects that we thought might be interesting to turn into musical instruments. So this was one particular junk shop on the outskirts of Edinburgh, which is just amazing, full of um, ancient uh, pieces of technology. So we went round and we gathered up a whole load of these objects. And then we set about trying to uh, automate them by adding robotic components to make them into um, instruments that could play, play sound. Um, we had funding from an organization called New Media Scotland, and we had about nine months to build the, this 21st century piano, uh, player piano, cyberphone. This is what we were aiming at. Um, so we wanted something that looked like an orchestra and it looked old, but behind the scenes it would be doing something unusual, doing something a bit different. Uh, this is where we started out. This is the porter cabin I mentioned in Leith. We really didn't know what we were doing. We, um, we got all the stuff into there and started trying to manufacture this uh, device. Um, remarkably, nine months later, this is what we created. Um, so we did manage to make the thing that we were aiming at. But that hides a lot of struggle and pain. Um, one example of that was about three days before the gallery opening. We'd finished building this in the porter cabin and um, the truck was going to come to move it to the gallery. And at that moment, we realized it was now bigger than the door. Uh, um, that was a very bad day. Um, but we, we, we survived, and we built Cyberfon, and there it is. So I'm going to show you a bit more details about, about what's inside it and how it works, and then we'll have a listen. So these are some of the objects that are inside it. This is a, a, a Indian classical instrument called a Shruti box, which, with, um, which we added uh, motors to to automate it. It's driven actually by a a um, piston that's driven by a old drill, electric drill that we found. We gave Cyberfon a voice. Um, it actually um, reads a poem sometimes. And we, we did that by pressing our own vinyl record that Cyberfon would um, play occasionally and then the sound would come out of those gramophone horns at the top. But the heart of Cyberfon is this. This is its emotion barometer. Um, Cyberphone goes through a range of different emotions, all the way from desolation to delirium. <laughs> and um, depending on its emotional state, it um, plays different kinds of music. So if it's happy, it'll play a more cheerful tune. If it's miserable, it'll play a very depressed tune. So what drives Cyberphone's emotions? So hidden inside Cyberphone is a computer. Um, and what it's doing is it's uh, Googling itself every 15 seconds. Um, it's looking on Facebook, Twitter, MySpace. There's nothing there. Cyberfon, it's gone. Um, and uh, tracking its own stats. It's obsessively um, interested in how popular it is. I built Cyberfon to have, have a kind of addictive personality. So if it gets some interest, it, it cheers up. But then if it doesn't get even more the next day, it falls into depression. Um, so this is some of the music that Cyberfon plays. Um, but enough chat about it. I'm going to uh, um, let you have a listen, and then we'll talk a little bit more about what happened to this uh, machine that we created. <laughs> Thank you. 
you. So, so one of the one of the things about this project that um, caught me by surprise is just at the last days, as a as we were installing it in the gallery, um, I had a bit of spare time, and I, and I thought. I, w I added one feature to it that I hadn't thought of when we were designing it, and I thought that Cyberfon should give something back to its audience. So I added a feature where it would tweet out and post on Facebook how it was feeling, and it would do this in an incredibly simplistic way. So it would just say, I am feeling, and then its emotional state, right? <laughs> so this is Cyberfon's uh, scintillating uh, Twitter feed. Now, the, the, the point, point about this is that there is nothing clever here, and it's obviously not a human, right? It's just saying, I am feeling, and then an emotional state. But what was really extraordinary is the response that that got. So people started responding and replying to it, responding to its emotional state. Um, and people would come in to the gallery and then tweet at Cyberfon, like, like, they would sit in front of Cyberfon sending messages to it. Um, start sometimes giving <laughs> advice. Um, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, kind of fun banter. Um, and sometimes uh, uh, people were getting a little bit annoyed at its kind of diva-ish <laughs> tendencies. Um, this, I love this, someone gave it a present of uh, furniture polish. Uh, <laughs> uh, someone was saying, why, why is it quiet today, Cyberfon? Did someone unplug your ethernet cable? <laughs> Actually, yes, they did. Um, <laughs> after that, I had to, get, when it, Cyberfon was plugged in again, it had such a rush of new uh, messages that it became completely overwhelmingly uh, delighted with itself. And then the next day fell into a despair because it didn't continue. And I actually had to get this the one time I had to go in and edit its memory and delete the memory of that <laughs> incident. Uh, yeah, very funny. Are you watching the Scotland game too? Um, so um, so that, was a, that was interesting. It was an interesting experience. Um, what happened next was very surprising. It became very, very famous. So it made it first in the tech press it, um, it became well known, and then in national newspapers around the world started reporting about Cyberfon. Um, and then the most biggest surprise of all, that the next year it won a BAFTA. <laughs> now, we weren't expecting this, but the, the important point here is that we didn't win a BAFTA. Cyberfon won the BAFTA. The BAFTA doesn't say uh, Simon Kirby anywhere. It's, it says Cyberfon. Um, Cyberfon couldn't attend the ceremony. Uh, so so we had to, we had to uh, pick up the award on its behalf. Uh, then, even more surprisingly, uh, the National Museum of Scotland here at Edinburgh decided they wanted to have an object that represented social media at the turn of the century. Um, and decided to collect Cyberfon. So it now belongs to the nation. And it went into the museum and had its own room in between the science and technology section and the art and design section, which was an amazing honor. Um, it's, it was there for several years, and it's now back at the stores in Granton. Um, and even it made it onto Google Street View. So this is actually a Google Street View image of uh, Cyberfon in an interesting twist of events. So that, that's the kind of story of our experience with Cyberfon. But here I am some years later telling you about it. So why am I bringing up this uh, project again now? Well, it, it's been interesting for me to reflect on what we learned from building this device. So I'd intended this to be a kind of mirror to hold up against our own obsessions with our popularity online and how, and I think people responded well to that and people saw in themselves, uh, saw in Cyberfon something of themselves. But increasingly, I think I've, I feel like I've learned a different lesson as well. At the moment, there is this growth, as you all know, uh, growth in chatbots. Well, we made the first one, frankly. Um, <laughs> and our chatbot, is made of wood and brass. Our chatbot does not pretend 
in some ways, it doesn't pretend to be something that it's not. You know, no one could look at Cyberphone and go, oh, I thought that was a person. No, it, but the humanity in it is the ability of an object that isn't pretending to be something it's not, allowing you to see something of yourselves. So in its kind of clunkiness, in its flaws, in its moodiness, um, there's something that we empathize with. The worry I have about tools like ChatGPT is that they are incredibly sophisticated and their sophistication is geared to giving people the impression that there's something there that isn't there. The, the, these tools have this veneer of perfection, which I think is very dangerous because they are not. They, uh, tools like ChatGPT have the same kind of flaws that humans have, but they don't appear to. So I'm going to end with a provocation as something that I've been thinking about having made Cyberfon and seen our responses. If our insecure, clunky, antique wardrobe can engender empathy, maybe we should be thinking about building the machines um, of the future to wear their flaws on their sleeves rather than hide them under a veneer of perfection. Thank you very much.